welcome to History 300, the origins of the First World War. Lecture 13, The Assassination. Today is June the 28th, 2014. So it is exactly 100 years ago today that Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary and his wife Sophia were assassinated by schoolboy Gavrilo Princip in the town of Sarajevo, capital of the Austrian province of Bosnia-Herzegovina. This act 100 years ago, which, as everyone knows, would set off a chain of events known as the July Crisis, which would end 37 days later with five of Europe's great powers at war. The consequences set off by Princip's fatal bullet would quickly overshadow the assassination itself, so that by the end of the July Crisis, hardly anyone could even remember that the original cause of the affair had been the death of an Archduke, now lying cold and forgotten in his tomb. However, it's important to remember that the Austrians based all of their subsequent actions during the crisis on the claim that Franz Ferdinand had been knowingly killed by agents of the Kingdom of Serbia. So before we move on from the assassination itself, let's consider who specifically was responsible for Franz Ferdinand's death, who knew what, why they did what they did, and why, in some cases, they failed to act on the information that they had. From the moment Franz Ferdinand and his wife were gunned down in their limousine, there was no question as to who had actually pulled the trigger. The murder in Sarajevo in June 1914 was not like the Kennedy assassination. There were no rumours of second gunmen on grassy knolls or magic bullets. All six of the conspirators who had been present in Sarajevo that day were quickly identified, and five of them apprehended by the Austrian authorities. The sixth escaped to Montenegro. Gavrilo Princip's central guilt was self-evident, and the young man himself made no attempt to pretend otherwise. Nor was there much question about why Princip personally had been eager to kill the Archduke. I am a Yugoslav nationalist, and I believe in the unification of all South Slavs and that they be free of Austria, he declared at his trial. Franz Ferdinand was a symbol of everything Princip hated, and by his killing, the boy hoped, quote, to do away with those who obstruct and do evil, who stand in the way of the idea of unification. Also, Franz Ferdinand's death would be, Princip said, a fitting revenge for all the torments which Austria has imposed upon my people. Princip had not expected to live to see the results of his handiwork. Immediately after firing his gun, he had swallowed a phial of cyanide, but the poison had merely made him vomit. His desire to kill himself fit right in to a certain Serbian romantic archetype of the valiant self-sacrificing patriot who dies while murdering one of the oppressors of his people. Princip, it was fairly obvious from the beginning, was not much more than a daydreaming teenage misfit who wanted to die a hero. I am not a criminal, he insisted, because I destroyed that which was evil. I think that I am good. The issue then was not who had killed Franz Ferdinand, but who had put him and his fellow conspirators up to it in the first place? From the beginning, Princip and the other members of the gang insisted that the plot had been purely their own invention and that they had acted without any assistance from anyone else. But the Austrian authorities did not believe them, and it's not difficult to understand why. It wasn't a very plausible story. After all, the plotters had been carrying hand grenades, automatic pistols with ammunition, cyanide capsules and money. None of the gang had any funds of their own. Someone must have had to give these things to them. Plus, several of the conspirators had clandestinely crossed over the frontier from Serbia to Bosnia back in May. Someone with knowledge of the security arrangements on the border must have helped them do this. From the Viennese perspective, all of this pointed directly towards Serbian government officials. The assassination, they quickly declared, had to have been instigated by the authorities in Belgrade. The problem that the Austrians had, however, was that while there was strong circumstantial evidence that the conspirators had been helped, that's all it was, circumstantial. As the Austrian investigators privately admitted to their own embarrassment, although they had strong suspicion that members of the Serbian government had been complicit, they had no hard proof that anyone specifically in Belgrade had done anything, certainly nothing that would stand up in a court of law. So what do we actually know 100 years later? It's pretty clear that the gang's story that they acted alone was untrue. 
They received extensive assistance from Dragutin Dmitrievich's secret organization, the Black Hand. The Black Hand was so secret, in fact, that the Austrians didn't even know it existed. All throughout the July crisis, the Austrians continued to blame the assassination on a patriotic society based in Belgrade called Narodna Odbrana. In fact, although Dmitrievich had been one of the earlier leaders of Narodna Odbrana, he had quarrelled with its other members at the time of the Balkan Wars because they didn't want to take the same militant line that he did. So in a sense, all of the Austrian rhetoric about Narodna Odbrana after June the 28th missed the point. They were blaming the wrong people. Dmitrievich probably did not come up with the actual plan to kill Franz Ferdinand, however. That idea was likely put into his head by one of his associates in the Black Hand, Rado Malababic, a spy who operated inside Bosnia-Herzegovina gathering intelligence on Austrian military activities. The three conspirators who were at the core of the plot, Princip and two other 19-year-old Bosnian Serbs, were recruited by Major Vojja Tankosic, another of Dmitrievich's colleagues. The other three assassins were recruited later in Bosnia itself. After Princip and the others agreed to take part in the assignment, they were then handed over to yet another Black Hand member, Milan Siganovic, an employee of the Serbian state railway system, who was their principal contact throughout. It was Siganovic who provided the boys with their weapons and money, arranged target practice training for them within Serbia, and who then organised their smuggling over the border into Bosnia. The idea of using all these middlemen was to create as much space between the assassins themselves and Dmitrievich, so that he could always then claim plausible denial of any involvement. But what did Dmitrievich think killing Franz Ferdinand would accomplish anyway? This is where the question of motive gets murky, because the thing that strikes you as you learn more about the assassins is what an unlikely group of terrorists they were. None of them had any real aptitude for the task. One of Princip's fellow conspirators had already attempted to kill the governor of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Oskar Potoriek, back in January 1914, but had panicked when he saw a policeman on a train and thrown his murder weapon out of the window. Princip himself was known to be a terrible shot and also could not keep his mouth shut. And sure enough, on the day of the assassination itself, almost everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Of the six men along the motorcade when it first arrived in Sarajevo on the morning of June 28th, two did nothing when Franz Ferdinand's car passed, the third threw a bomb which missed, and the remaining three could only watch helplessly as the motorcade sped up towards the town hall. It was only because of complete chance that later in the morning, Franz Ferdinand's car, leaving Sarajevo, took a wrong turning and the imperial couple found themselves a few yards away from Princip, armed with a loaded pistol. In other words, the fact that the plan actually worked was amazingly unlikely. Now, Dmitrievich was not a stupid man. He surely must have realised this. So why did he go ahead and send the assassins anyway? It's possible that he never really intended the plot to be successful in the first place. Dmitrievich may have sent Princip and the rest to Sarajevo, suspecting that they would probably foul the whole thing up, as they very nearly did, in fact. Why? because a failed assassination attempt with ties to Serbia would have been hugely embarrassing for the government of Prime Minister Nikola Pasic, Dmitrievich's arch-enemy in Belgrade. In the summer of 1914, the two men were engaged in a power struggle over which institution was really in control of Serbia, the elected parliamentary government or the army. Dmitrievich was head of Serbian military intelligence, and though he was only officially a colonel, he dominated his other colleagues within the army. Was Franz Ferdinand simply the victim of a domestic Serbian quarrel, then? It's important to stress that this is only a theory. It's impossible to know for sure what Dmitrievich was thinking. He was executed by his own government in 1917 for plotting a yet another murder against the heir to the throne, Prince Alexander. At his trial, he admitted having organised the plot against Franz Ferdinand in 1914, but he never adequately explained his reasoning. There is some, admittedly slender, evidence that he may have had last-minute second thoughts and tried to cancel the operation. But again, we just cannot know for sure. And what about Passage? What did the Prime Minister know? During the July crisis itself, Passage insisted that he had had no foreknowledge of the plot against Franz Ferdinand and that the first he had known about the assassination was when he received a telegram from Sarajevo on the afternoon of the 28th. We now know that this wasn't true. 
there is good evidence that Passage knew the basic outline of the plot as early as the end of May. His source seems to have been none other than Milan Saganovic, the assassin's main contact, who was covertly providing information about the Black Hand to Passage. Sometime later, on June the 10th, word was sent to the authorities on the border between Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina to watch out for any attempt at smuggling arms across the frontier. There were two problems with this, however. One was that it was too late. The assassins had already entered Bosnia-Herzegovina weeks before. The other was that the military personnel on the border were under instructions from their own officers to disregard any orders from the civilian government in Belgrade. Passage, in other words, was not in control of his own troops. If he could no longer actually prevent the assassination attempt from taking place, the Prime Minister did have the option of warning the Austrians, however. After Franz Ferdinand's death, Passage denied giving the Austrians any such warning. He had to, obviously, because if he had admitted that he had done so, he would also have been admitting that he had known about the plot in advance, something he insisted was not the case. But it does seem that Passage sent a warning to the Austrians, albeit not a very clear one. On June 21st, seven days before the murders in Sarajevo, the Serbian ambassador in Vienna passed along a message to the Austrian government that it would be inadvisable for Franz Ferdinand to travel to Bosnia-Herzegovina because of the risk of violence. The Austrians noted the warning coolly, but did nothing about it. It was, after all, phrased in such a vague way that it did not reveal the existence of any actual plot. Why did Passage not do more to try and stop the assassination? Did he want it to go ahead? Not necessarily. As I've mentioned before, Serbia was not in a good condition to wage war in 1914, having just gone through two gruelling conflicts in the Balkans. This was not the time to cause an unnecessary crisis with Austria. But Passage may well have been worried about the response from his enemy Dmitrievich if he tried meddling too aggressively in the plot. As those problems of border security show, Passage was not really in control of his own country in summer 1914. He may have been worried about the backlash from the army if he interfered in an attempt to strike at an enemy of Serbia. He may even have feared assassination himself. Perhaps, having made a couple of half-hearted attempts to intervene, he simply fell back on the assumption that the whole plot was so half-baked that it was bound to fail. If so, he was to be proven catastrophically wrong. In summary then, Neither the Austrian claim that the Serbian government had planned the murder of Franz Ferdinand, nor the Serbian government's insistence that it was completely blameless, was true. Dmitrievich was a high-ranking member of the Serbian military establishment, but the plot was dreamed up on his own initiative. He was taking orders from no one. Pasic was technically telling the truth when he told the Austrians that his own government had had no hand in the affair, but he omitted a lot of embarrassing details. He knew that something was afoot, but he did not try very hard to do anything about it. The fact that Dmitrievich could act with such recklessness and yet not even be punished by his own prime minister afterwards says a lot about the chaotic state of civilian military affairs in Serbia in 1914. OK, in the next lecture we'll shift our attention to Vienna and look at the immediate reaction of the Austro-Hungarian civilian and political leaders to Franz Ferdinand's death. See you then.